You're listening to Tim Bolkley's 5-Minute Bible. The Bible often puts two impossible things together. It's one of the consequences of trying to talk about something which is incomprehensible to human beings, beyond our grasp. One of my favorite examples is in my favorite chapter of the Bible, Isaiah chapter 40. There in verse 10, after all that stuff about preparing a highway through the desert, and how human life is fleeting and fragile, like a wild flower in the desert. In verse 10, you get the picture of God as the conquering king coming home with the booty after a successful campaign. See, the Lord God comes with might, and his arm rules for him, and his reward is with him, and his recompense before him. Now, if that was your only picture of God, you'd be in trouble. But then, suddenly, in verse 11, he will feed his flock like a shepherd, and gather his lambs in his arms, and carry them in his bosom. He will gently lead the mother sheep. So, there's God cuddling a fluffy lamb. But just a few words before, there was God, the mighty hero, leading the armies home. Either picture, on its own, leaves you with a distorted, inadequate view of God. Both together leaves you with a distorted, inadequate view of God, but it's a more adequate view. It fascinates me how often the Bible uses this technique. And today I want to look at it with you at book level. I want to start with my least favorite book in the Bible, since I've already talked about my favorite chapter, it's only fair to talk about my least favorite. And my least favorite book and least favorite chapter is Obadiah. Almost from the start, Obadiah sounds mean. Thus says the Lord God concerning Edom, we have heard the report from the Lord. And a messenger has been sent among the nations. Rise up, let's rise against it for battle. I will surely make you the least among the nations. You shall be utterly despised." And so it goes on, and the tone hardly changes. A few scholars think that they can rehabilitate Obadiah by noticing that in verse 15 and onwards we have talk about the day of the Lord, and a time when God will draw everyone to Mount Zion. In Isaiah that picture is glorious. All nations, or at least people from all nations, are drawn to Zion and saved. However, if you look at Obadiah, my feeling is that verse 21, those who have been saved shall go up to Mount Zion to rule Mount Esau, and the kingdom shall be the Lord's. Those who have been saved doesn't seem to include the Edomites. They're left out in the cold. My reading of Obadiah from beginning to end is gloating over Edom's fall. The God of Obadiah is the God of justice, because of course the Edomites deserved what they got. When Jerusalem was captured by the Babylonians, it was the neighboring Edomites who ganged up with the Babylonians, and as verse 13 says, on the day of his calamity you should not have looted his goods on the day of his calamity, you should not have stood at the crossings to cut off his fugitives. You should not have handed over his survivors on the day of distress. Because among the survivors handed over, King Zedekiah had his children killed before his eyes and then his eyes put out. Edom deserved what they got. But Obadiah gloats in it. It's my least favorite book of the Bible. But one thing it does do, and do firmly, is remind us that God is a God of justice, and that God's justice is terrible. But I think it's no accident that the book that follows Obadiah in the Bible is Jonah. In every Bible, Jewish, Christian, Catholic, Protestant, Greek, Hebrew, these two books go together. Sometimes one's first, sometimes the other, but always the two books are together. And what do we get in Jonah? Jonah's a bundle of laughs. From our smile at the ship that requires a fare, or that threatens to break up in a storm, through our laughing at Jonah, our giggling at the thought of chickens in sackcloth, or putting ashes on kittens, right through to the very last words, a bundle of laughs, and the very last words to truculent, stroppy, unhappy Jonah who hates the thought of the Ninevites getting something less than justice or more than justice. 
and should I not, says God, be concerned about Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than a hundred and twenty thousand persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also many animals? God is not only a God of justice. God is also, as Jonah recognizes, gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and ready to relent from punishing. By putting these books together one after the other, each of them means more than if either of them was in the Bible on its own. Good talking to you. God bless.